Okay. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, glad you could be here for this night, this January night. And we, this is, once again, our third edition of Faith and Politics, and uh, we're moving in a direction today that is um, highly hypothetical and highly theoretical, and uh, so it may not be necessarily the kind of thing that the world's most pragmatic people get into, but at the same time, I think you'll see the applicability of it uh, going forward. So that's indeed my hope. And what all this is, as we subtitle it here, Getting God Into Modeling, it's a uh, kind of a provocative title maybe, but uh, what it is is actually an attempt to put a divine dimension back into our political models for our society. And uh, I'll go into that in sort of detail in just a few minutes, but let's open up an order of prayer. So we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for those folks who are gathered. We thank you, too, for those folks who are going to be watching online. We ask your blessing upon them and uh, your blessing upon our understanding. And we thank you, God, that we can ponder such things in the relationship between faith and culture, on the relationship, too, between faith and politics and political culture specifically. And we ask that you might be here in the midst of this to make it all the more clearer, all the more poignant, and all the more inspirational. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, once again, this is Bay Community Church. My name is Pastor David McKenzie. Uh, one of the things that uh, God has led me to be part of over the course of years, although I didn't recognize it until a little bit later in life, was that I had a calling to ministry. I also had a calling to uh, continue on in certain educational elements and go into a fairly rarefied uh, topic or subject matter of, of political theory. And I felt like I had been, I had received actually the idea and the inspiration for this model uh, way back in the late 1980s. And I didn't know what to do with it at first, but I ended up taking it to my McGill University professor in Montreal and uh, showed him the first initial stages of the model. And he was an extremely erudite professor by the name of Douglas Hall. And he looked at the model and he kind of went, and he didn't dismiss it, so that gave me great, great encouragement. <laughs> Sometimes all you need is, is just a little bit of uh, that kind of, hmm, that might work, and, and suddenly you're off to the races. So that's how this kind of began, and it was kind of a, a God thing for me, although it sat kind of fallow for many years while I, I sort of thought about it and thought about it. And eventually, actually, I was able to do a, a, a master's thesis on the topic and uh, turn that into a, a bit of a book here that is available nowhere, by the way, so it's not like I'm profiteering off this. Uh, but maybe the second edition in another year or two will be up online. And so it's called The Culture Cube, so you can always uh, sort of bear that in mind if you want to look for it come the time. But it is about, it is actually taking the left-right political spectrum and adding additional dimension to it. So to make it a three-dimensional, actually, model, and uh, you get an additional information on that, including in this case, you could say a theological component, which is kind of handy, and I'll explain why. So without further ado, let's begin to explain why and why I think this is really important for us. Faith and Politics 3, getting God into modeling. Next. Oh, did I go twice? Yes, I did. There we go. Okay. <laughs> there we go. We're where? We're where we need to be. Uh, so here's the practical problem, and it is actually a very uh, subtle problem, but a problem nonetheless, and that is this, that those who control the models also control, to some extent, the metaphors that we have in the mind, and those who actually can control the metaphors of the mind can actually control uh, the framework of the mind, if you will, so that you can't break out of a box very well under some conditions. So to be stuck with certain models that are limited is actually, in, in a way, uh, detrimental to expanding the conversation uh, about things in public, especially religious things sometimes. And as we all know, the left-right uh, spectrum does not necessarily contain a deliberate uh, theological or theocentric uh, dimension. So in that sense, that's one of those things that I definitely wanted to correct. So, uh, you know, I'm not pushing any particular sort of conspiracy or anything like this per se. The, the left-right spectrum developed naturally, as it were, out of the politics of revolutionary France in the late 18th century, and where the radicals who were really pushing for the most uh, social uh, reconstruction and reform within the actual uh, country and nation of France 
sat on the left, and the ones who were more conservative sat on the right. And this eventually over time turned into our left-right spectrum metaphor that everybody pretty much knows. Is there anybody here who doesn't know that metaphor? I didn't think so. So that shows you how ubiquitous it has become. You know, it took about 200 years to get into our minds, or actually much, much less. But it, once it got there, it stuck there, and it tended to be ported from culture to culture to culture as a kind of way of referencing uh, political uh, partisan associations, you could say. So that's, uh, that's the, the, the sort of reality behind the metaphor. Oftentimes there are realities behind metaphors, other than that no one would understand them. And so I guess the problem is, is that if that's the metaphor you only use, you're limited by the limitations of that image. So that's the reason why I want to bust some images, I guess, or expand some images this particular day. Because this model doesn't necessarily do away with the left-right spectrum, it simply adds to it. So that's what makes it kind of easier in some ways on the mind. There we go. Whoa. <laughs> Boy, I must be hitting that thing too hard. Okay, here's, here's an example of limitations in languages. If we today were to call vaccinations needle rape, what impact might this have on vaccination rates? Do you think, do you think there might be a dominant direction that it might affect vaccination rates if we actually use that particular frame of reference, that same, that kind of visual element? Uh, I think it would probably go down, right? And then hopefully everybody would see my logic here in terms of why that would be so. Uh, it, it might, the new terminology would affect, I think, public debate and discourse negatively in that some sense. Um, you know, if I were to say, you know, you know, have you been needle raped or something like that? Uh, you know, someone might respond and said, well, rape is wrong. Why would, even, why would I even go there? That type of thing. So there would be a, a natural constraint on using that particular metaphor because it would be uh, deemed to be negative in some respects. So in, in, that, in that way, this just shows a, an extreme example, you might say, of why terminological stuff matters, why the metaphors and the symbols we use matter. They matter significantly, and they can actually set you up for a new understanding. They can also limit your understanding, as the case may be. Here's another thing. Now, this is, is going to be actually a good question for you. Can you describe to me the apparatus that completely revolutionized the automobile industry in the year 2037? <laughs> yeah, now why would that be? It hasn't happened yet. Okay, it cannot, it cannot exist as the question is framed. So obviously, there's not going to be a whole lot of response to that. Now, it's a silly question, I'll grant you. But you know, here's the thing, is that it shows you on some level that you are limited by what you don't know. And so a, a model or a metaphor that expands the kind of things that, that the mind can sort of put uh, you know, code hooks on uh, is actually better than one that can't. If, you're, if, you're, if the model doesn't include what needs to be included, you may never know that it is missing things because you're not even thinking of the things that it's missing. So therefore, omission is in some respects just as um, questionable as a, 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 a bad metaphor like, say, needle rape would be, or you know, something over the top like that. Uh, in that sense, uh, it's important to understand that because we don't know what we don't know, a metaphor that can't describe or won't describe or omits describing things is not superior as a metaphor. Everyone follow that logic, if you will? Okay. Yeah, it's just another way of putting it. Can you advocate for something that isn't yet part of the conversation? Maybe, if you knew it, but only if you knew it. Uh, and that's the key. So here's, here's just my general f uh, point of the last few frames. The framing of discussion from terminology and symbols specifically chosen to even the lack thereof is one means by which public perception and discourse can be limited or, sad to say, even manipulated. There could be, in, un, in any omission, there could actually be a reason or an agenda. It's possible. Not necessarily all the time. Since no model as well can be everything, whatever models we frame, we are limited by that frame. Does that make sense to you? 
You know, whatever, whatever we do design to describe our world is always gonna have limits. Like every parable of Jesus has its limits. You know, the metaphors we use in, in pop culture have limits. There's always limitations. And in some ways, it takes a better metaphor to expand the interpretation, if you will. So we can just go on with the next there, too. Okay, now here's a personal contention that I have. And this actually describes, to some extent, one of the assumptions that I'm carrying here. I believe that our species is religious, fundamentally religious. I don't care who you are. If you're, if you're an atheist, it doesn't matter. If you're an agnostic, it doesn't matter. There's something of a fundamental religiosity, if you will, that actually makes the species uh, on some level religious. Uh, we're looking, we're meaningful, we're seekers after meaning. And in, in that sense, we are, uh, I guess, did I use the big word here? Uh, no, I didn't, but that's good. <laughs> uh, there's, a phrase, there's a phrase called homo religiosus. <laughs> and all that means is, just like homo sapiens, uh, homo religiosus is the, the, the species that actually is religious. You know, humanity, religious humanity, I guess you could say, in some respects. So uh, that's, uh, I have a, a fundamental bias. Everywhere I look, I see religiousness on some root level. People seeking out meaning. I used to give this as a, a typical kind of uh, description for that, but you know, Wayne Gretzky would not have one side of his sweater up and one side of his sweater down playing hockey if he didn't believe there was a relationship between his sweater and his game. That's a metaphysical relationship. We cannot prove that there is some kind of good game that happens when his shirt is up on one side and down on the other. Uh, but that's the kind of things that, that people do, uh, even superstitiously, that gives some indication about the fact that the species is constantly looking for meaning, constantly looking for some kind of metaphysical connection or relationship or association between things. And on that level, everybody is a seeker as far as the, the species goes. So that's one of, my, one of my elements because if that is true, if the species is fundamentally religious, then why aren't our, all our metaphors incorporating some of that? That's the question. So that's the question that I sought to sort of you know, ponder as I, I derived this particular model going forward. So let's take a brief metaphorical walk of, of, uh, with, with what we know already. So you've heard me talk about the French Parliament in the 18th century. And uh, this is the, uh, you know, the, the actual traditional left-right model was inspired by the French Parliament. And you'll, hopefully you'll recognize it. This is put into sort of a general sense. Uh, and and um, does everybody see the writing? Because it is a little small, but uh, you know, I can walk you through it. Uh, you know, it begins on the left wing, far out on the, on the left there. There's Marxism, and then there's socialism. Closer to the center, you get liberalism, then you get the political center. Then you get conservatism on the right, and far, far out on the right is, is fascism. That's the typical kind of traditional model. It's, uh, it's got its weaknesses even right then and there, uh, and some people try to correct those, but that is the traditional model. If we render the traditional model into strictly American terms, we get the next one. So here on the left, you get the Democratic Party, you get a political center, and then you get on the right, the Republican Party. Now this is not to suggest that the United States doesn't have any more parties. There are lots of parties. There are uh, independents as well that, are, that would line up somewhere on this particular spectrum if you ask them. Uh, there's some that would line up off the spectrum and <laughs> they would tell you so. There's a whole bunch of different things. But in the strict sense of what shows up in the Congress and, and in the Senate, oftentimes it breaks down to these very uh, two dominant uh, flows of thought. And so that is, of course, the American model of the same. Hmm. There we go. Now, there are other modular proposals. There are, and this is just a smattering, there are uh, many of them. And people have tried to put pen to paper to sort of describe what, they, what they've been thinking about and knowing full well the, the limitations of the dominant model, I guess you could say. So here are a few others. Let's take a look. Okay, I was in grade 12 when my history teacher told me that, you know what, it sometimes makes a little bit of sense to bend the left-right spectrum all the way around and join the ends. 
And I thought, well, that's an interesting way of looking at things. Even when I was in grade 12, I was thinking, that's curious. Uh, you know, I should take a look at that and note that. And uh, so he discusses here, what, what you have here is you have the, uh, the radical edges of left and right bent around to join in the center here, which gives you uh, the advantage in this particular model is some people will say, well, you know, there are, there are really strong similarities between fascism and communism. They're both totalitarian in nature and things like that. And bending around and having them join at the edge, at the radical edge, makes some degree of sense from that standpoint. Uh, then you've got the rest that are scattered in, in approximately the same area that you might intend to see them if the lines were straight, but more or less they're bent around the corner as it goes. So that's the, that's the circular spectrum that comes, and it's sort of one way of, of explaining, I guess, the totalitarian element a little bit more uh, quickly. Now, you get a man by the name of Nolan, who uh, was a... Uh, a libertarian, a prominent libertarian in, in the United States. A lot of libertarians were never happy with the left-right spectrum because they weren't in it. Uh, and that makes sense. <laughs> and, uh, and so in, in that way, you had uh, a known libertarian who was the head of the Libertarian Party in the United States, if I recall, and he updated a political model based upon what he saw. Now this is getting a little bit more complicated. This is called the Nolan chart, and it is two-dimensional in, in the same sense that the circle was, I guess, in a way. Well, they're all two-dimensional to some extent, but uh, it's increasingly two-dimensional, let's say. And uh, you can see this element here. So what he's got is he, they, they juxtapose the libertarian, the, the freedom-loving, uh, non-regulatory believer, you might say, and the authoritarian kind of uh, ones that were, you know, prone to tyranny, prone to monarchy, and, and all kinds of things, various styles of authoritarianism. And then they had the typical uh, sort of left-right spectrum built in the middle, uh, with a prominent centrist area, which, to be frank, I don't know that it serves a lot of purpose in the model, to be frank, but at the same time, it does actually explain some things. Now, I should mention these two uh, terms back down here. Uh, economic freedom tends to go up from authoritarianism on the right-hand side to the fact that conservatives tend to be business-oriented and highly into uh, economic freedom. Uh, liberals, as well as this kind of climbs, goes up into the personal freedom dimension, and actually so does freedom in general go up as you actually raise uh, if, if there was a scale going up, you could see that. So freedom is going up on both sides. It just happens to be divided between economic and personal freedom. And that's why it's arranged, uh, arranged in such a manner. That's, uh, so that gets a little bit more unusual and complicated, but it gets worse. <laughs> Let's go to the next one if we can. Okay, this is Vosum's chart. Uh, Vosum, this is, this is way more complicated. In fact, even people like me have to stare at this for some time to get a sense of where he, he wanted to go. And he's, what he's done here is he's modified Nolan and put it into a three-dimensional aspect. And, and so that makes it a lot more complicated in some sense because there's an awful lot of writing here that can't really be absorbed very easily. But I'll tell you a little bit about this. There's a governmental focus, which is the third dimension. Uh, there's an economic focus, like there was actually in that Nolan chart, if you remember, that is there, as well as a uh, societal focus. So the individual focus is sort of removed and, and the societal take is taken in. So there's different scales in here of forms of democracy or forms of monarchy. And, and that's the thing, it incorporates monarchy, it incorporates democracy, it incorporates a whole number of elements there uh, depending upon what the process is and how much economic freedom and how much reform is in mind as well. So, honestly, I'm not a big fan of Vosum. I, I appreciate his attempt uh, to actually put everything into three dimensions, but I think you need some simplicity if you're going to actually impact a person's understanding of metaphor. So one of the priorities I also had for this three-dimensional model was to keep it really simple so that it was readily uh, in some ways understood and could actually become in its simplicity more of a symbol in one's mind. So I mean, while, so like I say, while I appreciate, excuse me, the attempt here, I, you and I both don't have the time to absorb the various layers that uh, actually Bosom is including here. Uh, and so in some ways it, it fails to my mind 
in terms of its, uh, of its, of its modular simplicity and therefore you know, its uh, portability, I guess you could say, to some extent. And here's what I say. Like, when it comes to the challenges of any model, the reason why the left-right spe spectrum is so popular is it's easy to understand. That's the simple truth. It, it carries forward because it could put a certain amount of, of information, some might say a significant amount of information, in a simple diagram and you, you kind of understood it. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that when you, when you think of political models and metaphors, symbols if you will too, uh, all, it's all like that. The modular challenges are it's, it has to be valid, right? it has to have validity, and it also has to have applicability I mean, if you can't apply it, what's the point? Uh, and it has to have digestibility. And, that, and that's the reason why I would say, if you're going to be looking to try to actually impact a person's thoughts in terms of what are they thinking and, and when, they, when they provoke, when this model is invoked in their mind, you know, is it, is it going to be digestible enough so that it can be re repeatedly invoked? So that it becomes a matter of habit, right? So I had those kind of goals in mind when, when I went and tried to create the culture cube. Something that was valid, applicable, and digestible, almost easily digestible, so that it could be reproducible in here. Okay, so that's uh, one of those issues that I think is uppermost in my mind. And it might be in yours after seeing the Bosom <laughs> diagram. All right. So I wanted to actually use three dimensions. That way I could pack more information in. I think there was some value there. And with familiarity and simplicity in mind, it, and when you would use that, it can satisfy all three of those actual elements that we raised earlier. Oh, right, I'm pulling, I'm pulling it the wrong way, aren't I? Did I, did I skip over something? No. Okay. Fair. So, the, the advantage to the culture cube, it makes use of the already familiar familial binary, if you will, of the left-right spe spectrum. And all I mean by binary is the left is defined in a certain way and the right is defined in a certain way. So what I've done is I've ac actually added two more axes uh, that actually are also binaries with different things on each end. And how it breaks down is it gives you eight different ideological places. And that's still re readily absorbable and it's logical and hopefully it, it's valid as well. Um, so, yeah, they're, and they're all, like I say, it's like having three right-left spectrums in different directions to make it into a cube. So here's the basics. Here's the basic sort of axes. So, and, and, and I want you to notice how intuitive it is. When we're thinking about God, in other words, theocentrism is God-centered. That's what it means. So theocentrism is a vertical axis, makes sense. <laughs> and at the far end of that is anthropocentrism, or human-centered. And obviously that's down where we are, so there's a, an attempt there to incorporate an intuitive dimension to the three dimensions. Political left and political right you already know. Now I want you to imagine actually something that's forward or back. Uh, so forward is the individual. That's where you are. You're looking at the model and it's forward on the model, so that makes that sort of talking about your own person. Farther back is collectivism. In other words, the group dynamic, the collective the kind of things that are large, common good type of issues, right? So that's, those are the three. And so because there are these six different zones based upon the word, I guess you could say, it translates into eight different uh, regions on the cube. So you don't get confused. Uh, you, every cube, if you want to throw a dice, it can only go up to six, right? But if you carved it into two sets of quarters, it would come up to eight. So, and that's, that's what this thing is. You've got eight octants of political ideology, uh, even if you have six sides, if you know what I mean. Okay. So we're gonna add some, uh, some box to the, the skin. Well, skin to the box. I don't know what you were going to say. Somewhere there. Oh, oh uh, yeah, Th these are just the definitions before I get there. Is it now, like I say, Left and right are replaced in my model with progressivism and conservatism because I didn't want terms that, that sounded pejorative. And as far as, um, I mean, 
terms can always change and become pejorative, I'll grant you that, but I wanted to choose ones that weren't as far as that goes. So I didn't put things like, you know, the commies and the capitalists or something like that. Like there wasn't anything like that. It was just designed to be fair to the model, fair to the political left, fair to the political right. So that's one set of terminology that you know that's about to be changed on the model, just, just so you know. Uh, collectivism, hopefully I've explained it properly, individualism too, and once again, if you just remember those two, anthropocentrism and, and, and theocentrism, God-centered and human-centered, uh, then you'll actually, hopefully, get the next bit as well. Any, any disturbances there? Are we still tracking with me? I know it's a little bit tough at this point. It'll get better. Okay, so here's, here's when you put skin on the frame of the box. The, the actual point in lines here, I want you to think of as forward on the cube. Now, of course, with any uh, line diagram, your mind can actually flip it. Uh, right, so you can put things that are at the front at the back, like it's an optical illusion in, in, in so, so many ways. So, uh, so I, I put it in, in a kind of a, with a kind of a line through it because I want you to look at it that way. All the subsequent models of the culture cube that we will use in this PowerPoint are, are all uh, with uh, the forward, with all, are, are basically all in that particular perspective. So the, the front part is somewhat downward and to the left, and uh, it's, uh, that's the near side, and the, and the far side is basically in behind with collectivism there. Does that make sense from the, eyes, the eyesight point of view? Okay, we're doing some funny things on the screen, I know, but we'll see if we can get through this before things get too weird. Okay, I'm very, very pink, but anyway. <laughs> okay, uh, now, uh, yeah, I, there's a note there. Um, when the axes are added, like the two additional axes, and the divisions between political ideologies are superimposed upon the cube diagram, uh, the next result, or the net result, it should say, is a three-dimensional model with eight different zones. I've named the zones. The zones are like, it's like a quadrant, is an area of four regions. An octant is like an area of eight. So each, each zone becomes an octant. So that, it's not often used in our language, but it does exist, and it made a whole lot more sense than, say, demi-quadrant. Like that, in some ways, that was a little bit more bulky and, and ridiculous. So it's called an octant after the word for eight. So here is the actual model, not in its, like there are different ways to do this, but this is the, this will help you, I think, but it is the terminology you will have to get used to a little bit. But it's all very logical. Uh, let's start with zone one, because they're all numbered in this situation. And what happens is they go around like a clock, front and then back. So that's how, that's the actual way you look at them. Octant one is the home of conservative, because it's on the right. Theocentric, because it's God-centered, it's on the top. Individualism, because it's forward on the cube. All right? So that's, that's why that would be individual. And it goes down, okay? the conservative anthropocentric individualism. That's below because it's sort of out of the theocentric uh, quadrant in that case. And then it is down below where you might, you might think to find the agnostic, the skeptic, the deist, maybe, maybe, uh, but not the theist. You wouldn't find the, the actual theist there. If you move forward, this is the direction of greater progressivism. So you would expect in this case to shift from conservative to progressive because it's going from right to left. It becomes progressive anthropocentric individualism. Still forward on the cube, so it's actually individualistic. Uh, still human-centered because it's still below the theistic line or the theocentric line. And actually it is progressive because it, it is now shifted left. Okay? Then you go up and you get the progressive theocentric individuals, individualistics, individualistic people. Uh, so in that sense, what has happened there is we've moved back up into the theistic realm so that you've got people who now believe in some god. It doesn't define what god, and that's one of the weaknesses of the model, although you could sharpen it further if you wanted to. But in any case, it does keep it fairly generic for general purposes. And then if you look to the back, where octant five is, once again, we're going around in a clockwise fashion. Octant five is the home of conservative, theocentric collectivism. In other words, it's up high, so they're actually theocentric. It's conservative because it's still on the right, 
And it's at the back, so they're actually more collectivist in their orientation politically. Then if you come down from that, you come to probably the rarest octant of all in terms of actual people who live there. <laughs> and that is a conservative anthropocentric collectivism. So in other words, they're conservative, they're on the right, they're human focused, since they're down below the, the, the theistic or theocentric line, and, but they're still collectivists. And the reason why that is a little bit rare is because, for, like take for example today, most collectivists are, you know, if you think of, of an, eco, an environmental commune of some kind, most, most, um, most uh, sort of collectivists of the conservative persuasion would actually, uh, would actually be not conservative in persuasion. They would be deemed to be progressivists. So if they're living communitarian, in communitarian ways, you don't find that many um, secular agrarian uh, cults, if you will, or, or groupings where they just basically are uh, leaving progress to somebody else, but we just want to live next to the land anymore because an awful lot of people who are interested in the land these days, they're interested in progress. So they would describe themselves as progressives, they would not describe themselves as conservative. So that's probably one of those reasons why this one is a little rare. When you move over here, you've got down low progressive anthropo anthropo anthropocentric collectivism, and that would be uh, you know, much more in keeping with where some people might be ideologically who might be in group or communal type settings or have a, a much more collectivist worldview. You don't, you don't have to live with 14 chickens and 10 goats to be a collectivist, I should say that. It's not that kind of sort of hackneyed cliche. There are collectivists who believe in collectivism that actually are just maybe interested in cooperative housing or they're interested in, in certain group dynamics within their particular uh, family unit or something like that. Uh, but they are, nonetheless, if you put them on a scale, if you actually, if you actually give them the questions, and this is a, something I, I'll, I'll refer maybe back to in a, at some particular time in the future, is that, they're, that I, I, I got this model and I tested this model with an actual uh, questionnaire, about 33 questions or so, and it measured actually uh, each octant a, a multiple of times. And, and so I can honestly say that there's a certain breakdown in, in the certain location where I was that, uh, that shows that these, these elements do exist and they exist in certain proportions. It's actually quite interesting. And, and like I say, that's why I know that this is relatively rare. Uh, progressive theocentric collectivism also exists. Uh, and it's up in the far corner with the octave eight. That would be people who would still identify themselves as being left of center and, theocentric, and, and yet very theocentric as well as collective in their orientation, okay? So and we'll go through, uh, actually, and, and it'll get even clearer as we move forward. Any, any immediate questions there? Because I know that's a lot to take in. That's about as uh, tough as it'll get, by the way. All right. Okay, and like I want to say, actually, in chapter six of the book, and uh, you have before you, uh, there are extensive definitions of each term, right down to the octant. Uh, so in, in, in chapter 6, there actually is a definition of the, of the general categories of the three axes. And in chapter 8, there's extensive definitions of the combinations that result. So all of that actually is there for you if you want to take a look. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> yeah, this will help. Okay, so here's some questions for you. Okay, well, you knowing what you know already of the model, although you may feel like a little uncomfortable and hardly an expert, but that's all right. Where would you put the Amish? Correct. The Amish would go there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. So, so yeah, you got on pretty quickly. That's all right. That's all right. Okay. Where would you put Franklin Graham? Best guess. I mean, we don't know. We're not giving the test, but you know, what would we? Where would we probably put him? Franklin Graham is, is Billy Graham's son. He's an evangelist. Sorry, I thought I was choosing somebody that would be known, but maybe not. Well, let's, put, well, let's say Billy Graham then. Where would you put Billy? I'll step out of my way. Correct. Octon one would be the logical choice. Here. Yeah. For conservative theocentric individualists. All right. So where would you put the Hutterites? Now, this is a bit tricky. It depends on how hard you weight certain things. This is why, you know, as I'm sure Tom would agree back there, 
uh, what would we say, rubrics matter in a teaching kind of element? It, depending upon how you, how you weight the rubric, the Hutterites would be different than the Amish. So what would, uh, what would you say? Six. Six. Now, would you think that the Hutterites are anthropocentric? Oh, no, I, sorry, I six That's okay. Oh, you're, you're talking about there? Eight. 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 Yeah. Bang. That's where I put them. Now, now, understand this. They may not be as um, progressivist as some people might think. But what I'm actually trying to say here is that, that the Hutterites, because of their interest in, in constant technological change, I mean, the, the Amish don't actually have that, but the Hutterites do. They're, they're interested in, in, in keeping up to spec with sp specifically agricultural technology. They will adopt that very, very quickly. So that would make them certainly relative to the Amish. It would put them to further left than they. So that's why, even though you know, if you tested them, that might not be the case. If you, if you talk to certain individuals, they'd probably just be a little bit to the left. Like maybe they'd be actually five, but swinging on the left side of that. There is, a, there is a part of the model in the book, but not here, where I actually talk about subdivisions within each octant, because it does have a little bit of scalability. But nevertheless, for our purposes, that's probably where we put them if we, were to, if we just applied one to each category, or as many as that are there. Where might you put Norman Bethune, if you remember Norman Bethune? Three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. You put him right here. <laughs> you're, you're not too sure that he's actually uh, <laughs> very theological. Well, that's true. He, yeah, he, he, he wasn't necessarily. You know, you know, we can talk about this. What, what I would tend to, 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 to suggest, I guess, because we, we can't really know because we can't test Norman, but I would put him actually further back along the collectivist line. Yeah, so for me, he's probably not as much an individualist as he is a bit of a collectivist, actually. Uh, his work in China and things like that being, you know, under Mao and being recognized like he was, uh, you know, that, that for me, it seems like he was leaning in a much more collectivist angle. I might be wrong, but in any case, that's kind of the debate, right? Because you, you don't know when the person is deceased, you can't really test them as far as it goes, but it would be in that, in that zone. Is everybody understanding that particular dynamic. Now, as how many people watch Parks and Rec? Nobody here watches Parks and Rec? It's kind of a funny show, but anyway. Um, there's a character in, in Parks and Rec, this is why his name's in quotation marks, named Ron Swanson. And Ron Swanson is, I'm sure he's designed by the writers to be a, almost an archetype of a libertarian. So if you knew that much, you know, what would you say, where would Ron Swanson go as a, a, like a hardcore, uh, sort of average libertarian, where would he go? Libertarian? American libertarian, I should say. Well, he's obviously going to be on the left side then. Uh, well, it, it depends on how you want to actually, I mean, the, you're right, and at the same time there's a little bit of an issue because uh, the, the anarcho-libertarians uh, were definitely leftists. The, the classically liberal uh, libertarians in the United States today tend to be more conservative. Yeah. So classical liberalism has, has, has come to be synonymous with libertarianism of a conservative persuasion, if you know what I mean. And Ron Swanson is that guy. Like, he's the guy who, uh, you know, he doesn't... Uh, He's not interested in progress. He's certainly not interested in big state stuff. He's a guy who's interested in eating meat, <laughs> hunting, and being left alone, <laughs> and having no regulation in governance to basically bother him. So, uh, so what would you do? Yeah, that's exactly where I put him to. If, if they were going to write his script, I suggest that that's, that's where he's at. So those are, now I didn't have a full eight, but in any case, uh, that gives you a little bit of a sense uh, of, of where it is. Now, now can you see a little uh, beginning, uh, are you beginning to see where, from a personality point of view, this might be applicable in certain situations in terms of archetypes? Because what, you know, Ron Swanson is, is a perfect example of a literary character. He's designed to be an archetype. He's designed to be like that certain person you know that fulfills uh, multiple, you know, dimensions of what a, an American libertarian is supposed to look like. That in that sense. So he's deliberately designed along ideological lines, his character. 
Uh, you can always flip a character and turn him into something when he goes insane, which makes it kind of fun for comedy. But you know, that's that kind of thing is, is going on in the literary realm. And I'm sure that if you think about movies and, and television shows you've seen, you can probably identify characters that are designed to be caricatures, like political caricatures. Well, they're designed with a certain model in mind and a certain understanding of what all political elements are supposed to look like. Ron is one of those, and like I say, he would tuck in very easily into what I would call would be octave two, I do believe, <clears throat> if I've analyzed him correctly. Uh, so if you ever watch the show, he was the guy with a bushy, bushy, bushy mustache, so just, uh, just so you know. <laughs> All right, well, we're moving on. So and you'll see some, at least uh, some applicability there. Now, here's the interesting thing, too. Uh, you can adapt the culture cube to a, a particular historical context, which kind of makes it adaptable in that sense. Uh, specific contextual additions of the model can be used to explain relative political positions in specific times and places. Like, we can't test these guys, they're deceased, right? But we can take educated guesses. And so this next model focuses upon Anglo-American thought in the 19th century. Okay, so we're going back a little bit further historically, but I think it'll be interesting to see. Okay, so here's, here's some more archetypes, you could say. Uh, and once again, it's the same uh, orientation, but it, it, I haven't described it for you. I've just used the numbers as the basic descriptions. It's the same positions, everything else. So let me explain maybe some of this. Um, and uh, you know, some of these folks you may know, some of them you mo won't, and so, and so that maybe makes it a little bit more of a challenge to spot them. But the more you know about some of these characters, the more you'll go, oh yeah, I, I, I see that now, that type of thing. So we can talk about the actual uh, famous preacher in uh, London. Uh, a guy by the name of Charles Spurgeon, a, a Baptist, uh, very much his own man, uh, very much a guy who had a lot of uh, individual uh, gifts and individual prowess, uh, basically uh, preached some very, very powerful stuff for years in London, and, and was certainly known as a, a character. Uh, and if you were to, to look in terms of where he even lined up with respect to his contemporaries, you would probably put him in Octet One, uh, where you might put uh, an evangelist of today. Uh, he was certainly conservative biblically. He was uh, highly, highly theocentric, very much a God man, uh, God's man in that sense, and uh, was obviously too, uh, like I say, a, a serious individual character of the kind that was uh, uh, typical of the age and uh, sort of uh, noteworthy for his particular presence, for sure. Uh, so that's Charles. And he would be uh, placed in probably an octave one. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, you may not know too too much about, but he, uh, what you what you do know, need to know about him is he's a romanticist. He is a historian. Uh, he can't stand Calvinists, like Mr. Spurgeon. <laughs> and uh, as a net result, he's defining himself always over against theistic types, and he's uh, and yet he still is conservative. Like he's. He's in that zone where he's, he's interested in the, in the romantic elements of, uh, of romanticism as a philosophy. He's also into uh, his own understanding of history and is a historical mind and a capable one at that. So he's an obvious candidate for the octant two element. If you move forward from that and into the progressive realm, you, you bump into a fairly well-known name uh, by, by, by a fairly known, well known man by the name of Charles Darwin. Uh, in all probability, you know that he, certainly in the latter half of his career, was uh, predominantly focused in, in a, in a human-centered direction. Uh, the, the God language that he might have used when he was younger uh, was in, in large part left behind. Uh, he still obviously, as a, as, a, as a Brit, is aware of the Anglican Church and some of its elements, and, uh, and yet he's doing his thing with his evolutionary theory in a progressive way, and he's being hailed as the next generation of smart guy, that type of thing. And so clearly from that standpoint, uh, he is uh, he's probably occupies often three. I mean, we can debate the individual points. Anyone want to debate that, that he's actually here? That's fine, but that's, uh, uh, I think, probably where he needs to go. Uh, I put Elizabeth Fry in Octave four. Obviously, uh, you know, she might be a little bit relative to Charles. She might be over here, right? Uh, Elizabeth Fry, and she she represents actually some of the some of the 19th century social evangelicalism that develops in England. 
Okay, so Elizabeth Fry, you know, did everybody, has everybody heard of the John Howard Society for Prison Reform? Okay, Elizabeth Fry works in prison reform as an evangelical believer. Uh, she seriously reforms the UK prison system, you know, with, and, and like I say, the John Howard Society is a, a peripheral to that as well, but her work was uh, stellar, and she represents those, like Florence Nightingale, she represents that, that, that group of people highly impacted by the social desire to improve England by the evangelical groups in the Anglican Church. So, affected by the Clapham sect, affected by William Wilberforce's le legacy, uh, affected, maybe even a contemporary in this case, although maybe slightly earlier, to uh, Lord Shaftesbury, the seventh Lord, who actually freed all the chimney sweeps with his legislation. He was a strong evangelical Christian out of that mold, that 19th century Anglican mold, and, uh, and went after the legislation that kept chimney sweeps chained to the inside of their chimney. Uh, so, so Elizabeth Fry is right in that zone, and, uh, and I imagine that some of us can, can connect with that significantly because, uh, like I say, her faith was put into a, a, pro a really prominent desire to help clean up England uh, and change the social fabric in that sense. So one, that's Elizabeth Fry. One chimney at a time. Hmm? One chimney at a time. Yeah, one chimney and one, one prison cell at a time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, we can go back up and to the right again, to the Shakers. Now, there's an argument that would say that the Shakers might have been more progressivist than, say, the Amish, and you'd be right. But they still are agrarian, they still, still are communal, and they are next to the, when you line them up against the Oberlin col colony, they are actually more conservative. So once again, this is one of these ones where, you know, maybe the Shakers might have been a little bit forward on that one, a little bit slightly left, I guess you could say. And, but they certainly are still to the right of the Oberlin colony that we'll uh, talk to as well. Oh, I, I, I forgot my friend Carl. Yes, Carl Marx. Anyone have any argument there that he's an anthropocentric collectivist who uh, is a progressivist, is deemed a progressivist? A utopian, in fact. So progressivist, he's a utopian. So th that's why Karl Marx is, is basically down low, but for, uh, to, to the hard left, far left of the actual cube itself. So that's where Carl's going with his Das Kapital and everything else. Uh, okay, the Oberlin colony, I probably need to explain to you as well, but you'll probably remember maybe something of it, maybe? Um, everyone remember Charles Finney? He's the evangelist and revivalist in around the 1820s, upper New York State. Charles Finney is the guy that makes the, uh, uh, he's the first guy to really kind of make popular an altar call, if I recall. He actually even has what he calls a, um, what was it called, the, the, the anxious seat. And the anxious seat is for those to come forward and, and sit in a certain part of the sanctuary because they're anxious about coming to Christ. They, they can't wait anymore. So there's an anxious seat uh, that actually Finney adopts and things like that. And there's a few other things that he did. He was quite uh, unconventional in, in, in a way. But as it turns out, uh, his itinerant ministry ends because his greatest intercessor, a man by the last name of Nash, he was called Father Nash by his friends, uh, he ends up dying. And, and Finney says, I can no longer do itinerant evangelism if I don't have that guy interceding for me everywhere I go. Because Nash was a, was a monster prayer guy. I mean, he was just, you know, he'd go into town two weeks earlier and, and he, he sometimes could be heard a half a mile away in his prayers. Okay, so we're not talking like quiet and subdued, okay? Seriously loud guy in terms of his intercession. A anyway, the, the, as, the, as the account goes, when Father Nash you know, passed away, Finney goes, well, maybe I gotta settle down in my ministry. So he went out of an itinerant evangelist ministry as a revivalist, and he went into uh, becoming a president of a, of a group that was to become a college. And that college was Oberlin College. And, you know, he was highly Holy Spirit driven. Uh, his, sometimes people would say that his rates of conversion exceeded almost all known evangelists. Uh, clearly, clearly the Holy Spirit was in the midst of his one-two punch with Father Nash. Uh, and when he settled down at, in and around the Oberlin area in the U.S. Midwest, uh, he becomes president of this college and they start an academic program designed to, to talk to people about evangelically and, and to, to put some academic uh, education in the midst of things, and a, so higher education with respect to that. Well, Oberlin College becomes the, the second college 
uh, to actually graduate Afro-American graduates. Uh, and so it becomes known for being uh, very, very open because of its revivalist base, becomes very, very open to anyone who needs to be pushing forward in uh, higher education is welcome here. It doesn't matter uh, what uh, particular ethos uh, or ethnic group they represent. And so clearly, just to show you how weird it was, by the time Finney basically died, within just a few years after Finney's death, that same college for a time went back to segregation. So, so, if, so Finney's influence on Oberlin Colony kept that on, on the forefront, not only of a collectivism, a Christian collectivism, but also on the forward component of a progressive, collecti a, a pro a progressive Christian collectivism for its day. Right? You know, if you pop some of these characters out and put them into the 21st century, they, they probably all would look pretty conservative but for their time, relatively speaking. And in terms of relative positions, that's a good framework for the 19th century. Any questions on that? Yeah. Do you have a cube for the 21st century? You know, I, you know, I haven't created the cube for the 21st century, but we can certainly do that, uh, you know? And I do like the fact that, you know, sometimes in understanding the cube, it's nice to have archetypes. You know what I mean? Like, like people that, um, that represent almost in a cliched way the, a, a position on the cube. So it, it, it is kind of interesting to think about. So yeah, we, we can do it, we can do it. Okay, now we're just gonna fiddle a little bit. We're gonna play with the cube for the final part of our, our time and just fiddle with some of the assumptions and some of the implications of the culture cube because that's kind of fun. So there's a group, there's a kind of a sub uh, theme here that we could call Affinities and animosities, which actually is kind of useful in some ways, if you can remember it. Okay, first of all, let's look at affinity. Uh, theoretically, any group that occupies maybe two out of the three things that you do, let's say, would probably have some way of connecting to you relatively easily. So in other words, like if we take a look at this, let's take a look at this top group here. The top group have, it shares two things in common. They share a common theocentricity, and they also share a common individualism. Although we have to be careful, individualism is one of the, 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 the glues that isn't very sticky. Because you're an individualist. What do you care about anybody else, right? <laughs> well, I'm being you know, completely uh, unfair. But at the same time, two out of three, might, there might be some commonality between this particular group much like you can still find ways to gather with progressivist or conservative Christians if you really want to. Uh, so in that sense, you know, your average ministerial might have some commonality along this way. Now, it's not like there couldn't be tensions, but generally speaking, there's a few things at least you can talk about. Likewise here, if you were to take this, this group, these two, so one and two, well, you'd have a common conservatism, and you'd also have a common individualism, so there might be a, 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 fair, a, a fair bit in common that you could continue a conversation with. Up here, of course, uh, a common theocentrism and a common conservatism would probably make it easy. I mean, you know, um, I don't necessarily hang out with the Amish, but I, I'm always fascinated when I visit them, that type of thing, you know, that kind of, so that, those kind of things can, can actually forge at least some sense of, uh, of affinity, things that you can actually be in, things that you can actually identify as being in common, and in that sense workable in terms of conversation, workable in terms of evangelism under some conditions, where you've got, you know, a, a sort of an up and down kind of dimension to it on the, on the vertical axis. And, you know, there might be ways in terms of talking about various things that way. We'll go into another direction here. Now, here's a quote from uh, sociologist George Yancey and his academic partner here, David Williamson. And it says this, in theory, there are two main reasons why individuals oppose the Christian right. First, they oppose the political agenda of the Christian right. Second, they oppose the religious nature of the Christian right. In reality, we found that many of our respondents combined both political and religious animosity in discussing their opposition to the Christian right. So we're gonna move in the direction of animosity here, as you can probably anticipate, and show why in some ways it's difficult to actually get beyond certain boundaries. And uh, George and 
David have identified the fact that there's multi-factors in some of our animosities. Yeah, in fact, they've identified two dimensions of disagreement for some individual, that some individuals have for conservative Christians, evangelical Christians, or charismatic Christians, or whatever. Uh, obviously, they, they may disagree politically, and obviously, they may also disagree religiously. So there's, right there, it points to the fact of multi-axes, multi-dimensions of the disagreement. And uh, Yancey does an awful lot of sociological experimentation with left and right as it pertains to religion. So he's, he's one of those favorite guys I like to follow on Facebook. He's very, very fair and very, very empirical. Uh, and he, he's an he's a, he's a actual blessing to the name sociologist, which has not got a great street cred right now in, in a lot of uh, circles. So anyway, Furch does all right, though. Okay, so animosities. What I want to point out here is that the, the, the actual corners of the cube, the opposite corners of the cube, are gonna represent three dimensions of animosity, potentially, and so they're probably where you can identify the biggest cultural fights in short term, in just a short, pithy way of putting it. Not necessarily, but oftentimes in an explanation kind of way. Okay, so we have here, like, let's take a couple of examples. Uh, the conservative theocentric collectivism, okay, and the progressive anthropocentric individualist have very little in common from the standpoint of this model. And, and these are key axes. I chose them because they're, they're huge culturally. There, in almost every culture, there is a collectivist, individualist kind of dynamic. There is a religious, non-religious dynamic, and there is a, a, a progressive and conservative dynamic. And so these are huge axes to actually incorporate into a model. So it's not surprising that the results will be relatively huge as well, that they represent real, real, real life issues that happen. Likewise, a, a conservative theocentric individualist probably would have difficult Difficulty relate, relating to a progressive anthropocentric collectivist. Uh, now we can apply, you know, names to this, of course, if we want, and some of them you will have heard before. Okay, so <laughs> would atheist evolutionary bi biologist Richard Dawkins plan his vacation in an Amish commune? Uh, it's possible, it's possible if you wanted to do some, I guess, biological research there, I, I don't know. But I'll bet you anything, it's not his first choice. Uh, and, and so in that sense, it's difficult to imagine a, a, a room that where you have uh, Richard Dawkins and the Amish gathering in the same spot and having a lot to talk to. I think there'd be a lot more puzzled looks between the two sides, if you will. And that, I, I think, is, a, is an archetypal metaphor that uh, at least explains in some respects why these three dimensions tug in such a, a significant way. Likewise, you know, would a Marxist society invite an evangelist like Billy Graham or, 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 or Franklin Graham to be the keynote of their local convention? Uh, you know, can't really picture that happening without some insanity somewhere. So, and, and this is the kind of way in which the actual cultural cube can describe real cultural tensions. Because when you do get three dimensions of differential, it's really significant. And, and, and it takes an incredible diplomat and real grace to transcend those dimensions uh, in any situation. Others, you know, there's more common ground that can be found. But in terms of the three core axes that we've identified as significant, that, those are hard ones to transcend if all three are running against you. And that probably, describes some of the dynamics that we have culturally in the 21st century on some, in some manner. Now, here, when we're, when we're still on the topic of animosity, how about church animosity? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna introduce you to a new term here. I have, I've mentioned it in the odd sermon, but I'm gonna mention it here. I, I like the use of the word fractal. Uh, and fractals, uh, the, the easiest way I can explain, explain a fractal is, uh, have you ever noticed that the limb of a fir tree looks an awful lot like a fir tree if you cut it off and you stand it up? Yeah. Now, the limb is smaller, 
and the tree, the, the full-grown adult tree, of course, is bigger. However, the same mathematical relationships that govern the limb govern the tree. So that even though it's a smaller model of the tree, it reflects the same mathematical um, order, you could say. So fractal geometry is the thing that in the 1982 Star Trek uh, Khan movie uh, was the thing that made the planets look realistic. Because what they did is they fed in a brand new uh, algorithm into the computer that was based upon fractal geometry of repeating mathematical patterns all the way down to the microscopic level and all the way up to the macro level. They fed that into the computer's uh, video card, I guess, ultimately, and out came a planet that had, never, that had never looked better. You know, if you go back to the original Star Trek series, all the planets look kind of really bad, and where'd all the clouds go, and, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. Uh, but the fractal geometry corrected all that because it created the same kinds of patterns that create a seashore, also are the same patterns that create a mountain range. Like, it's, very, it's very similar in some respects. So that's, uh, that's the thing. So when I talk about a fractal, I'm talking about a fragment that still has the same properties, in a way. Okay, so let's pretend that the entire lower element of the, of the culture cube doesn't exist. Okay? That's why it's in dotted lines here. So that leaves, for the sake of argument, that just leaves everybody who is a member of a particular theistic group. So we'll use Christi the Christian church because it's just easy that way. Okay, so there are, there are progressivists within the church that are more, and there are more, some that are more conservative, and there's some that have high church, you know, theocentrism, and some of that low church theocentrism. Well, here's the thing, is that to the degree to which these dimensions are floating in space, that they're all relative. There are some that are higher, some that are lower, some that are in the middle. These can create the same forms of animosity that you'd see in the bigger model. And here's, here's a good example. I think I've got it coming up here. Oh, did I get too far? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's the one I wanted. Okay, so, so even opposite corners of the theocentric quadrant, not the full cube, but just the theocentric top four groups, could represent a growing strain upon Christianity and culture. For example, would a meaningful communion be possible between, for example, an old order Mennonite group and the Reverend Greta Vosper? Now, some of you may not know Greta Vosper, but she, she has a center for progressive Christianity. She is now a full-blown atheist. She started as somewhere theist to deist, I guess, and she has she's gone down, if you want to put that, could you back up and put that previous model on? Like, Greta has gone from around here down actually here, down probably into here. Now, meanwhile, you know, you've got your conservative collectivist, collectivist old order Mennonites here with a pretty high theology, right? Or you could say, well, what about like an Anglo-Catholic order? You know, yeah, pretty high theology and communitarian still very conservative. Yeah, it, it, pr it produces the same t tensions as the full model does, except in miniature. And that describes, I think, some of the religious debates that, that happen between uh, not just progressivist churches and conservative churches, but actually progressivist churches that are becoming more and more anthropocentric, maybe more and more agnostic, maybe more and more atheistic, if, if Greta Vosper's any indication. It's not just a matter of left-right, in other words. That's what I'm driving at. There's more going on the left-right. There's up and down. And then there's that front and back dimension as well. All right. Is everyone clear with that? Is it, like I say, it's a segment of the model, but the same tensions can be reproduced within them. All right. Okay. Uh, the importance of God in politics. Well, you've heard me say that the reason why this model has a theocentric, anthropocentric axis is because I believe it's important to talk about that. And not only that, it's not just talking about it, it's important to understand that, that there's uh, this dimension in all of us. You know, this dimension is real and is valid. Therefore, why is it that it's not incorporated into our models is the, is the question I wanted to ask. And, you know, here's the thing. When we talk about the importance of it, well, it's also, this is also a contention of a whole lot of people, not just me, but certainly me as well.
You know, I've noticed this. In the presumed absence of God, notice I didn't say in the absence of God because I don't believe God is absent. In the presumed absence of God, the politics of the world always becomes elitist. I, I, I want to point out Darwin in this situation. You know, Darwin, you know, is sliding away from believing in God as he ages. He's also actually doing a lot in a social Darwinistic frame to understand that somehow there's a difference between his European-centered, you know, sophistication and the, you know, quote-unquote savages he's bumping into in Tierra del Fuego. And I don't think that's by accident. I think when you take God out of the picture, it gives humanity a real excuse to concentrate on what makes for the best citizens, what makes for the most enlightened people, what makes for the political elite to be the political elite, so that quite naturally, you see, the, see God's the great equalizer, because God's basically said, hey, everybody's a sinner and needed grace, right? And so we're all in the same boat together. Take God out of that picture and all you've got is humanity left and you begin to differentiate between humanity along elitist and populist angles. Right? The grassroots and the you know, patrician classes, right? Functionally, of course, Rome historically uh, had a pantheon of gods. Okay, so suppose that they were really, really religious. Functionally, pragmatically, everybody noticed there that there was the patricians and the plebeians. You know, the, the upper class and the lower class. I think that's quite natural when, when, the God, when a God of real revelation is actually traded for something that doesn't have a lot of meaning or actually gets beamed out of the equation altogether. Human beings naturally look around and say, that person's lesser, that person's greater, that person's smarter, that person's dumber, that person is more of, of the kind of person we're looking for, that person isn't. It's, it's actually quite logical and almost predictable. So I, I go on to state this, with no God above and humble religiosus below, there's that phrase again, the, the, the religious species, the collective state is inevitably deified. So government, if you beam God out of the equation, the state and government is turned into God. Predictably, individual demagogues may also be deified in the perceived absence of true deity. Those are, by the way, a couple of quotes from my third book. It still hasn't come out yet. And it's going to be more like a, a collection of political proverbs with a biblical basis. So that's where it's going there. But that's how, one of those key things that leads me to understand the, the importance of God in politics. But if we, wanted to, if we wanted to imagine God gone, if we wanted to, this is where it would go, I believe. Predic in terms of how I would predict things would go, the, 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 basically the divine section would be occupied by the elitist presumptions. And then below it would be the populist grassroots trying to make their way out of whatever problems that they're in inheriting from the, from the oppressive structures. So that everything else is the same, so, but, but often one turns into conservative elitist individualism, or uh, often seven turns into progressive populist collectivism. Right? So that, this is just another way of looking at a different form of context, like if you were, and in some respects I would like to say, wherever God isn't, this model is probably operative at least in a semi-free state. I mean, because in, in a totally unfree state where the elite has taken authoritarian control, they'll simply stamp the lower class into the dust. Right? And so, so that, that's just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just know this, that if you, if you beam God out, I don't think you actually do yourself a favor. And uh, there's already elements of elitism and populism that are bursting forth at this point in our particular context as well. Okay, the model and prevailing cultural winds. Now, <laughs> I'm gonna blow I'm gonna blow you away terminologically one more time, so you have to forgive me on this, and it's just abbreviations. And they're actually kind of they, they're very workable, but they if you don't understand where I'm going or where it's come from, you probably won't get it. So let's take a look at this. Okay. This is the culture view again. No change. This is back to the original design, but octave one. Instead of calling them you know, theocentric, individualistic, uh, conservatives, or some combination, 
we've abbreviated as theoindicons. Okay? So there's theoindicon, anthroindicon in number two, anthroindiprod number three, theoindiprod at four, theocollecticon at five, anthrocollecticon at six, uh, anthrocollectiprog at seven, and theocollectiprog eight. And those are just handy handles if you want to put it in to a much shorter term, so that's why I put it there. But that's not really the point of my page in this case. I want you to try to guess the cultural wind. Okay, so along the three axes, what do you think is actually happening in general? Okay, so let's start up here. Let's start right in the middle, actually. Which direction do you think the current culture in Canada is blowing? Is it blowing towards greater theocentricity or greater anthropocentricity? Down, okay? Anyone else want to disagree? No. I would agree. I would think that that's the, that's the dominant direction in one, in one, on one axis. Now, which do you think is actually the dominant left-right? Is, is actually the left growing or is it the right growing? Which is growing? It's the left. Okay, I would agree. I think it's going down and I think it's going to the left. Now, when you look at the third axis, is it growing more individualistic or is it growing more a collectivist? Hmm? Individual. Yeah, you know, you can, you can, and this is where there's a little bit of ambiguity in the model type of thing, is that you can make a good claim for the, you know, for example, the autonomy rights that are, that are existing with, with respect to the individual. Like if I want to think my way into another gender or something like that, seems to indicate a growing sense of individualistic autonomy. And I agree with you there. Um, in general, I, I, well, this was five years ago for one thing, when I, when I looked at this. And I might make some adjustments with respect to that potential, but I still think in some ways there was a demonstrably collectivist move at the time that I actually did the test on individuals near Edmonton. Uh, I was actually quite shocked at, at the number of, you know, because oftentimes Alberta is associated with a fair amount of rugged individualistic types, you know, rednecks, etc. Well, there are plenty of pickups in this town I was testing, I'll tell you. Uh, and yet what I found was a surprising number of collectivists, especially given some of the questions I was asking about soft collectivism, which is, you know, a psychological collectivism uh, that might sort of emphasize, you know, to what extent would you leave your family if, if there was difficulty or to what extent would you submit, that type of thing. There's like forms of soft collectivism that are measured in, in say, the harmonization capacity of a human being. Do you want to harmonize or do you want to actually uh, you know, strike out on your own regardless? When you factor in soft forms of collectivism like that, you get a, a pronounced sense of a growing collectivism. So it, it kind of does depend upon the rubric and the questions you ask. I acknowledge that. But when I actually threw it all together, it was actually to the collective form. Now, if, if you took those winds and you put them into a container that could actually, you know, trap the winds where they were supposedly headed. They would be headed where? Ultimately. Seven, that's correct. They would be headed here, right down that way. Okay, now I just want you to think about that. If, if that's the dominant direction of the wind, who stands in the greatest opposition to the wind? Not two, one. Guess where a lot of us are. So in other words, whose who's octant is going to be the most prophetic by, by mere virtue of its existence if the dominant winds are as I anticipate? Church. It's us, church, and the evangelical church. So who's going to be actually Targeted. Who's going to be look like the most like the oddball? Who's going to be the person who just you know has to be the the most hardy in order to avoid all the inertia? Us. So in in that sense, if you if you take a look at the wind, if the wind understanding and the model are to be uh, understood and are valid, then. You know, we could, we, could, we could argue, for example, that if it's individualism that's going to win out here, guess who becomes the opposite then? The theocollective opponent. 
So the Amish become the target. The old Lord Mennonites become the weirdos. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's the thing. So uh, it's either, it's either going to be these two based upon what we acknowledge of the dominant winds, depending on how we break them down. So, you know, you know that line in the scriptures where it talks about, you know, and this is a call for the perseverance of the church? Well, that is a call for the perseverance of the church. Okay. Everyone tracking with that? Do you understand where I'm headed there? Okay. And this just, uh, and this, this explains just exactly what I just said. Under some conditions, the prophetic octant will be one. Under some conditions, the prophetic octant will be five. Um, but either way, it looks difficult for Christian, or, or, well, actually for, for conservative theists of whatever persuasion, whether they're collective or whether they're individualistic. Either way, so yeah, this is just a synopsis. What this means is that going forward, all things being equal, it is evangelicals or their conservative communitarian counterparts that will face the biggest cultural pressures and political animosity. Well, honestly, you probably knew that already, didn't you? <laughs> so like I say, I, I think there are valid elements to the model it, when, you, when you look at it in, in, in a different kind of way. So, you know, thank you for coming once again. I do actually have uh, just a moment here to, we have about 10 minutes to, to take questions. So um, this is kind of my closing statement, I guess. Uh, ultimately, it's my hope that with models such as the Culture Cube, we can put the issue of theocentric belief back into the public political conversation. Without God in the equation, politics will inevitably make up its own petty divinities. The state will become God. It is up to a free society's, or rather, it is to a free society's credit that discussions of this kind can be seriously considered. Uh, so there's sort of some of the more of the rationale for the model and what I think some of its advantages are. Getting God back into the public conversation, probably a good idea to have, even if it is difficult. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Closing questions from you, if you have them. <gasps> yeah. If you had the data, or the, yeah, the question is, can you put a culture in each box as opposed to an individual? Well, if you, if you had the data for a, a large block of people, like, let's say you had a, what they call like a metadata package for a group that you could honestly measure as a group. So, uh, yes, you could, but it would be a lot. I mean, the, the size of the, and scale of it would be significant. Uh, it, admittedly, folks, my own, in my own thesis, my, the, the size of my actual you know, study was, 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 was basically about 70 households that responded to me. I sent out about double that in, in sort of invitations, but of course, it doesn't go always there. So it was a small sample size is what I'm saying. So obviously that makes for a large degree of error. However, because I think that there's a fair amount of uh, qualitative analysis that goes into a test of this kind, in some ways I don't feel bad about the margin of error because there was an awful lot of... Uh, you know, like I say, it was, it was over 30 questions and it, and it nailed every item on the question multiple times from different angles. So in some ways, it had a fair amount of uh, qualitative analysis and not just quantitative. So I'm fairly confident that, that, that it represented some elements of what I was seeing in my community. But it would have, of course, benefited from a 2,000 person study for sure. Mm. But just to answer my own question, right. it seems to me that uh, the variable here is education. In that, Certainly there's a, there's a, 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 a truth to that. Uh, and you know, I, I guess in some ways as I pondered what kinds of axes I could have chosen, you know, there are different axes that you could choose. These ones tended to me to be the ones I felt were the most um, kind of transcendent in some ways, like they were everywhere to some extent, but you know, 
I, I think I have to admit, and in, in the chapter I do, I do go through uh, some of the weaknesses of the model. There is a chapter on just on the weaknesses of it. And one of those weaknesses is not only that you can choose other axes if you feel so moved, you know, you, you could actually choose altogether different ones. Uh, but also the fact that it, it, it takes a certain amount of, of societal freedom to produce this. And, and freedom is not measured anywhere necessarily here either. Like it's not an axis that measures freedom. Uh, be, but because you can't get a multiplicity of different understandings without the educational component to do it, I suppose, on some level, but also without the freedom to do it. it you know, if you're not being allowed to actually be a believer, for example. Well, education is freedom. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you know, on some level, yes, it, it can be both freeing and a symbol of freedom. Uh, and, and so there's a number of issues just like that where it's true. You know, you can't see, this model would look really weird if there was no freedom for believers. You know, it would shrink to virtually nothing at the top. So you'd have a very weird looking semi-cube. It would be not even a cube anymore. Uh, likewise, anywhere where the government is trying to control a certain aspect of society, uh, you'll find that it might still exist in underground forms, but it's no longer public and it's no longer even something you can mention. So in, in that sense, there's gotta be a certain amount of freedom before you actually have a three-dimensional form that's honest. I think that's why I like um, some of the, uh, you know, I love the 19th century because there's enough really wide variety and there's enough freedom in nations that you can actually see individuals maybe more easily than you can in the 15th century, for, for example, where things are a little bit underdeveloped, not only educationally, but even in terms of, you know, what the, what the church might allow in Europe and things like that. Right? So, yeah. Um, I was going to say, it's not just the idea of education. Like North Korea, I believe their citizens are well educated, but they don't have access to the media. Um, and they, well, they don't have access to the media, but they don't have access to the media. And they are all sorts of, or they have media and education, but it's completely controlled by the, the government. So they, that's so it's not the education in that. What's that? Education is not a factor then. Well, and, and neither, but it's totally controlled. Yeah, you know, I mean, th there are those dynamics, right? There, you know, if you if you have education but you don't have freedom, or if you have freedom but you don't have education. Well, I mean, if they're controlling education, yeah. what's that look like? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, what's that look like? Well, it's certainly in the, on the authoritarian zone, highly collectivist in some ways. <laughs> uh, but you know, there, there you go. All right. Any other questions? Uh, if so when not, you're, when you're talking about Theo, of course, you're talking about a, a Christian God. Yeah. 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 How would things change if we included it all? Well, it, you know, this this was a bit of a compromise. You're right. It was designed to actually appeal to the broadest cross section of the sort of total community. So what I thought was, well, I'm not going to necessarily at this particular point create a specific Christian understanding of God, but I will remain. It'll be it'll be just simply a theocentric viewpoint. Now you can have a theocentric viewpoint as a Muslim, as a Jew, as a even as a polytheist. If you were, you know, that's th theoretically that could mean a lot to you as a polytheist to have a theocentric point of view. But you're right; that's one of the weaknesses of the model. It's designed to be generic to reach the most amount of people without necessarily throwing them off, throwing them off from a terminological point of view. But you could, at the same time, insist, like if you got into a Christian context and you wanted to test this. You could turn all the theocentricity into, say, Christocentricity. Uh, and, and you could actually nail it right down. And, and, and if you wanted to, you could swap out and make a contextual cube within a, a Christian culture or subculture, and then you could go at it from that angle. You could. Uh, but for the purposes of the broader community, and for the purposes of just wanting that compromise to say, hey, we need to be able to talk about God even in ways that maybe doesn't, don't just exclude other people, okay, we can at least start there. So that's why, for the sake of the, of the model, I just made it relatively generic and left it up to the individual to decide what that meant to them. Uh, yeah, but you're right. That's uh, it's not exactly the kind of sharpened sword that some people would prefer. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Like I had ideas actually of, of doing some speaking at, at teachers' conferences and see if uh, the book might be useful for social studies, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jordan would like it? Well, maybe I'll get him a copy. I think, I think he would get it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, there's application for sure. Thank you all for coming. I think we probably need to say goodbye to our friends on video, so we can do that. Hopefully they're still there with us.